When you work at the front desk of a hotel, you have the opportunity to meet many guests. But some guests check in, but don't check out. Our next story is called I Used to Work at a Haunted Hotel and is written by Reddit user Eggplant Next Door. Look, before I get into what happened, I just want to preface this by saying I know how mundane the title sounds, okay? I know all hotel workers claim their place of work is haunted. But this one was different. If it didn't sound so stupid, I'd say the place was possessed. Or even a demon itself, somehow taking on the form of a building. I started working there the summer I finished school. I'd gotten my A-level results, and I have to admit, I hadn't put and put in enough work for them. I'd scraped two C's and a D, barely passes, and not good enough to get into any of the universities I'd applied for. My mom was disappointed in me, surprise, surprise, and gave me two options. Try and get a uni place through clearing, or get a job and pay her rent until I could afford to move out. Obviously, I picked the latter. The hotel was called Grimhale and was less than an hour's drive from home. I was interviewed by a short, balding man with tired eyes and a weirdly pink scalp, as if his hair had been pulled out and not fallen out naturally. He introduced himself as Ned and seemed eager for me to start. I'd been a little suspicious of this at first, in case the desperation for staff was something I should be concerned about. God, I wished I'd listened to my gut. Grimhale itself was less of an eyesore than you'd expect. It had five floors, with twenty-four rooms on each, splitting off of snaking corridors, carpeted and wallpapered in fading shades of red and brown. Each room was basic. Double bed, ensuite bathroom, closet, desk, heater, and full-length mirror. Strangely, none of the rooms seemed to have windows, despite the fact many of them had external walls, and the building itself appeared to have windows from the outside. At first, the experiences were minor. The front desk phone would ring, and when I'd answer, no one would be on the other end. Requests would come in from rooms for extra towels, or to make a complaint about something not working, only for the room to be empty when I'd get there. Freshly replaced light bulbs would burst within hours. Random objects would seemingly disappear and then reappear again in the most obvious of places. Of course, I was nervous to start with, caught off guard by these strange happenings. Being the youngest and newest staff member, I was hesitant to mention anything to any of my co-workers in case they laughed at me or brushed me off as some anxious kid. It wasn't until my third month on the job that things began to ramp up a little. It was past 2 a.m., and I'd been sat in the back office, with the door open, in case anyone came to the front desk, when an animalistic shriek rang out through the lobby. I sat bolt upright in my chair, needle-like prickles running down my spine. For a moment, I wasn't sure what to do. I knew I should check the lobby, but the dread creeping over me told me I should hide and definitely not go investigate. Choosing my job duties over my fear, I crept out of the office and into the reception area. Everything was as still and quiet as it should be. Part of me desperately wanted to slip back into the room behind me and lock the door. But instead, I picked up my flashlight and skeleton keys and started making rounds through each floor, poking my head into every unoccupied room and darkened stairwell. I found nothing. After that... I couldn't seem to go a week without hearing the scream during a night shift. Oftentimes, when I worked a morning shift, 
Guests would come by the reception on their way to breakfast and complain about seeing someone in their room the night before. They usually described a dark figure with a slim build standing in their room blocking the door or looming over them before fading into nothing. These sightings only seemed to happen on floors two and four, most frequently in rooms two, seven, fifteen, nineteen, twenty-one, and twenty-three, and more often than not, with women. Every time I was sent to clean one of these rooms, I would try to wrangle someone else into coming with me. Not because I was lazy, but because I hated being in those rooms alone. But normally, there weren't enough workers on shift to allow two people to go do a single-person job. It would be fine when I'd first enter the room, but the longer I'd be in there, the seemingly heavier the atmosphere would get. I'd feel like someone was staring at me constantly, a pressure building in my head until a migraine would begin to burn behind my eyes. Plus, I could guarantee I'd lose something every time I cleaned one of those rooms. Even if I'd emptied all of my personal effects before I entered, I'd leave unable to find a spray bottle or a cloth, or on one occasion, my whole belt. Of course, there were lots of smaller happenings too, just like any haunted place. Hanging lights would swing with no breeze, doors would open by themselves, the front desk bell would ring with nobody around. Clatters and bangs would emanate from the kitchen hours after it had closed for the night. An invisible something would tug sharply on my hair and clothes, as well as trip me up. Honestly, while it did all freak me out, I just put up with it. Yes, I was struggling to get more than five hours of sleep a night, and my mental state had definitely taken a toll. But for some reason, the idea of quitting hadn't really crossed my mind, other than in the form of a fleeting thought. I was oddly drawn to the hotel, as if under some kind of spell or curse, almost like I couldn't leave. The final straw, however, was when the apparitions started appearing. I don't count the shadow men on floors two and four, as I never actually saw anything myself. The first one was a woman, dressed in muddied gray, crying in the lobby. It had been another tiresome night shift, and my nerves already felt frayed by 3 a.m. when the sound of someone sobbing rang out through the reception area. I'd rushed out to the front desk, heart pounding and desperately hoping whoever was there was okay and uninjured. Sitting in the middle of the maroon carpet was a woman in a dirty gray tracksuit. The fabric was torn at the knees, and I could clearly see blood seeping through the ragged edges. Her face was buried in her hands, her dark hair spilling like waterfalls over her trembling shoulders. I approached and tentatively touched her upper back in an attempt at comfort. I was nineteen at this point, and while I like to think of myself as pretty socially competent, consoling a crying adult was still beyond me. Ma'am, what's wrong? Has something happened? I lowered myself and allowed my full palm to make contact with her shoulder blade. A grotesque shudder ran through her body, almost like a convulsion. She began to rise, sitting up more fully and turning towards me. Then she pulled her hands away from her face, and I recoiled in horror. It couldn't even be said she had a face anymore, really. Just a gaping maw where her lips should meet over her teeth, below a ripped nose and eye sockets filled with some kind of goo. The jagged teeth wrenched further apart as a scream erupted from the thing's throat, and I flinched back, shielding myself from the sight. After several agonizingly long seconds, I peeked through my fingers and found she'd vanished, leaving me cowering on the old carpet alone. Once the floodgate opened to them, they never seemed to stop. That's as much as I can bear to recount for today. 
I know the nightmares will be back tonight. I'm sure of that. But I know some people are really into this kind of stuff, so ask away. I'll try to remember as many details as I can. A couple days ago, I posted some of my experiences in a haunted hotel I used to work at. Well, I've quite a few questions and suggestions, so I figured I'd do some digging and asking and see what more I can trudge up about the place. I'll be honest, working at that place fucked me up a bit, and writing this all down is definitely bringing it back, but maybe it'll help. Catharsis or therapy or something? Firstly, to answer a few people's questions, I didn't really discuss the happenings with my coworkers. It was just one of those unsaid things that everyone experienced, but nobody wanted to talk about. Like I said before, I felt almost trapped there. Maybe that's what made us all keep relatively quiet about it all. That being said, there were a few euphemistic exchanges about the activity. Stuff like, Floor 2 seemed to have a lot of visitors last night. Or, Would you mind coming with me to clean this room? Always gives me the creeps but never really anything deeper. Someone suggested messaging a couple of my old co-workers, and after some digging, or stalking, through Facebook, I managed to find a few. Only two got back to me, but I can't really say I'm surprised. If one of them had messaged me asking about the old hotel, I'd be a bit suspicious, not to mention apprehensive to respond to. One of them who often worked alongside me on shifts, though we didn't really go much beyond small talk about music taste, pets, and TV shows, said she used to hate cleaning on floors two and four, too. She was concerned it was just her imagining things, so never thought to mention it, for fear of being thought of as crazy. She said on more than one occurrence, in one of those rooms, she'd catch a dark shape flicker through the edge of her vision. The other co-worker who responded is a similar age to me. He joined not long before I left, so while I didn't interact with him too much, we did talk a little on shift, mostly due to being the youngest workers. He said he'd also seen the crying apparition, but not as intensely as I did. Apparently, he'd been on the first floor, cleaning in the corridors, when he'd heard her crying and had gone to investigate. As he came down the stairs... He walked towards her from the side, but stopped dead when he spotted dark blood leaking out from between her fingers and where her palms were pressed against what should have been her face. At that point, he just noped out, turned around and headed back upstairs. He quit a month or two later as he was leaving for university. Some of you wanted to hear some other experiences I had there, so I've managed to compile a bit of a list of some of the other activity. The lift would play up, seemingly getting stuck at the third floor. No matter what button you pressed, it would stop at the third floor. Even if you closed the doors and pressed another floor button, the elevator would seemingly move and then stop at the third floor again. The lift would bleed from time to time. I don't mean like the Shining-style blood flowing out the lift doors when you called it to your floor— I mean like you'd be standing in it and something would drip on you. You'd wipe your face and find blood. Looking up at the ceiling, there'd be fat droplets seemingly dripping from the metal paneled ceiling and running in sluggish streams down the smeared walling. Certain rooms weren't ever occupied by guests. One which never seemed to heat up. There was always a light coating of frost on the inside of the windows, and you could see your breath. We had a maintenance guy up there once, but he couldn't find anything technically wrong with the heaters. Another occupiable room was one where the lights refused to turn on. Again, nothing technically wrong with them, but the switches just didn't seem to work. The female co-worker I messaged said she'd had an experience where the lights wouldn't turn off in there. I never experienced that myself, however. There were a couple rooms where guests continually reported having their duvets yanked off them in the night, 
and often asked to switch rooms. I witnessed this a couple times, and they always had the same look in their eyes, like they didn't want to acknowledge that what they'd experienced might be something they couldn't just explain away. Speaking of which, Grimhale seemed to maintain majorly positive reviews online, or at least that I could find. Even then, the more negative three stars and below reviews mostly targeted the food quality, service, or cleanliness rather than anything abnormal. Maybe as an employee, I saw these hauntings all the time, but most guests only experienced a single event at worst, and often just defaulted to explaining anything unusual away. I also messaged Ned, my ex-manager. I wasn't particularly hopeful he'd come back with anything useful. He was a nice enough guy while I was working there, but he often gave me the impression of being a skeptic, and that anything abnormal was better off being ignored, else you were just inviting it to keep on doing whatever it was doing. His response was a little lackluster, but not surprising. While he didn't actually tell me if he'd experienced anything himself, he did point me in the direction of some explanations for the things I'd seen. He gave me a list of case names, told me to do my own research, and asked that I don't try to contact him again regarding the hotel. Apparently, the female apparition I'd seen, the one in the lobby in gray, was a hit-and-run victim. She'd stayed at the hotel with her boyfriend, who dumped her and driven off in the car they'd arrived together in. He'd cheated on her with her best friend, and she'd been sitting in the car park, wretched and sobbing. She couldn't seem to get through to anyone for a lift, and had resorted to attempting to hitchhike. She stepped a bit too far into the road, trying to get a passing driver's attention, and was caught by the vehicle. She somehow got caught in the tire, a ripped part of the hubcap, I think, and had been dragged along the road, which tore off her face, shredding through her lips and splintering her teeth. By the time the driver noticed, it was beyond too late. Another case explained an apparition I saw on more than one occasion. A balding, middle-aged man wandering around the halls. I never saw him in the same place twice wrapped in a towel, and shivering. The first time I saw him, I thought maybe he'd locked himself out of his room. He just stood there, glancing around anxiously and making these odd whimpers like a kicked puppy. As I approached him, this overwhelming feeling of sadness washed over me. That's when I noticed the concerningly grayish-white tinge to his skin and the dark blood soaking his towel. It was streaked in huge patches, so brown it was almost black. I stopped dead and stared, wide-eyed and panicked. The man suddenly noticed my presence and jerked his head up in my direction. He moaned out something that sounded like, help me. His arm extended, and I could see the tacky, half-dry blood smeared down his forearm. I instinctually flinched back, and within a moment, he'd crumpled down to the floor, leaving nothing but a stained towel in the hallway. Every time I saw him after this, I asked him some variation of, Sir, are you okay? Do you need help? I remember seeing in some stupid ghost hunter show once that sometimes spirits are just souls trapped here, unable to move on, and all they need is someone to help them. I don't know whether I actually believe that, about the souls and all, but I figured I had nothing to lose. Didn't ever stop me seeing him, though. He always vanished the same way, crumpling down into the floor and leaving nothing but a dirty towel. According to the article I found, the guy had attempted to take his own life, less than a year before I started working at the hotel, in his room. He'd stripped climbed into the tub and slit his wrists. Then, as he lay there, bleeding out into the water, I guess he changed his mind. He wrapped himself in a towel and tried to call the police, but by that time he'd lost a lot of blood. He lost consciousness before he could say anything more than help me to the operator. The worst apparitions, though, were the kids. They weren't covered in blood or had black demonic eyes, 
they just got to me in a way the adult apparitions didn't. Don't get me wrong, I was scared of the woman with no face, and the man in the towel always made me feel even more depressed than normal for the rest of the night. But the kids just got to me. I've always had a soft spot for them. I used to have a younger sister, but she died of cerebral palsy when she was seven and I was fifteen, doing my GCSEs. There were two different child-aged apparitions. Well, three, technically. The first was a little girl in a pair of faded blue dungarees and a red striped top. Out of all the apparitions, I saw her the most. I'd notice her in the corner of my eye. She always made me jump, just standing there, hands clasped in front of her, watching me. She was small, skinny, and pale, no more than six, I think, with mousy hair tied up in two pigtails on top of her head. Whenever I saw her, she wouldn't move, just stand there and watch me work. She wouldn't ever respond to anything I said either, and the one time I tried to approach her, she simply faded into the wall behind her when I got within a meter or two. Of all the names Ned sent me, I couldn't manage to find anything on her, even when I did my own research, trawling the internet for history on the hotel. Nothing. The other one was a pair of kids who played in the stairwell. There was a boy around three or four and a girl about eight. They'd come running past me whenever I was going up and down the stairs, giggling and shrieking with laughter, their cheeks flushed and mouths wide with grins. To start with, it made me happy to see them. I was always on my way to check a room or clean something, and a break from all the other frightening and depressing occurrences in the hotel was very welcome. After all the negative energy, it was encouraging to see such carefree spirits. I was so enticed by their laughter and fun that I didn't even stop to consider why there were child apparitions playing in the stairwell. That was until one shift. Ned had asked me to clean the stairwell banisters. This particular stairwell stretched all the way up from the ground floor lobby to the fifth floor. I was up by the fourth floor, scrubbing the banister. Having started from the bottom, I was nearly done. The kids had appeared when I'd reached just below the third floor. Immediately, a smile had formed on my face. I was glad of the pleasant company and entertainment. Around the fourth floor, though, was when it happened. A series of heavy thumps that seemed to go on far too long. Then a loud and solid thud. I could hear the little girl's laughter dissolve into nervous giggles as her footsteps pattered down the wooden stairs. Panic bit into my heart, and I stuck my head through the banisters, peering down. The girl screamed. My heart lurched. Even from the fourth floor, I could see how twisted the body of the little boy was. His limbs were bent at odd angles, and his head snapped back in an uncomfortable shape. Blood was already beginning to soak into the beige carpet around him. My hand flew to my mouth as nausea spiked in my stomach, rising up my throat at speed. I stumbled to my feet, flew up and out into the fourth floor corridor. I barely made it to the bathroom opposite the stairwell before my stomach emptied itself. I left early that day and called in sick for the rest of the week before handing in my notice. I lied and said I was having a hard time with all the responsibilities. I said I was leaving with immediate effect. Ned was pissed at me, but I didn't care. If I'd told him the truth, he probably would have understood, been sympathetic, but I just couldn't bring myself to do it. Maybe I was ashamed I'd broken so easily. I don't know. But all I could think about was the sickening thud that little boy made when he hit the floor, and why the little girl's spirit was stuck there, too. I haven't dared to research that case, if there are even any articles about it online. I've got enough nightmare fuel already. 
I've moved on now, though. There's a local college that does online classes for adults, and I've signed myself up. Once I've posted this, I'm going to start looking for flats nearby. Writing these things up has made me realize I need to get myself out of this depression rut and move on. Can't let myself be haunted by the past. Not anymore. Maybe some of you listeners out there are on the job now, working a quiet overnight shift somewhere. When the quiet hush of the late night hour descends, maybe you can imagine hearing some quiet footfalls just around the corner, but no one's ever there. Makes me glad our broadcast studio isn't haunted. Well, not yet. If you enjoyed tonight's story, you can find links to the author's Reddit page and story in the description below. Please leave a like there. And don't forget to like this video and subscribe for more scary stories like this one. And don't forget, don't fall asleep.